Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us uh, for this morning's program, Asteroids, Comets, and Near-Earth Objects. Uh, there's a lot of natural debris in space. Depending on their paths, composition, and locations, they have been assigned different names. They are most, uh, mostly harmless, but uh, this morning we're, we're going to find out what they are, how they affect the Earth, and what NASA is doing to study them. Uh, NASA Solar Ambassador Regina Conrad will discuss the NASA Missions Double Asteroid Redirection Test, also known as DART and the Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, also known as NEOWISE. I love these acronyms. Uh, Conrad, uh, so Regina started as a weekend planetarium educator back in 2005 at the Andrus Planetarium in the Hudson River Museum uh, in New York uh, after her first total eclipse, uh, solar eclipse, which I, which I somehow I misspelled solar. I don't know how I do that, okay. Well, I should have edited this. Uh, in 2011, she was invited to speak regularly at the Stanford Museum and Nature Center before the Friday night observation. And now uh, retired, uh, Regina is a solar system ambassador with NASA. And she's also, I love this, a part-time library program coordinator for a small New Hampshire library. Um, so all uh, 80 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Regina for joining us this morning. And Regina, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, the asteroids, comets, and neo near-Earth objects. Um, since the very beginning of time, people have looked up in the sky and um, saw the stars, the moon, the planets, the sun, um, and comets and meteors. Oh, where's my arm? Oh, there's a meteor there. Um, they knew that the um, sun, moon, stars, and comets were slightly different because they moved. They moved. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, it's only sharing the screen? No. There, there we go. They moved. The uh, planets moved in the sky so they could tell that they were different. Um, however, they did know about comets um, in the 1600 BC. There are records in China saying that they were aware of comets. Um, and there were actually recordings of the location of comets tails in um, 600 BC in China. Um, comets were studied and, um, and looked at um, throughout the ages and there were pictures about them. Uh, the one on the left is a tapestry done in 1066 um, during the Norman conquest. Um, and they were considered good omens and bad omens, depending upon who won the war. And um, this is a, the other one is a drawing from uh, the Book of Miracles from uh, a 16th century German book. Um, Aristotle and the Greeks um, had all sorts of theories about the uh, comets. Um, some of them thought it was, uh, they were planets. Um, others said they couldn't be planets because they weren't in the ecliptic or, or the zodiac, the zodiac area of the sky, which is where the planets and the sun and the moon are. Um, but then they had to be planets. The, uh, the other thing that they also knew is that there were very many people or a few people who thought that it was a heliocentric society. Um, but it couldn't possibly be a heliocentric, meaning that everything went around the sun, because if the earth was turning, everything would fall off. So that was just one of the theories. So um, they weren't all myths in the ancient days, but they, their, their ideas were not always accurate. Um, we know that the comets orbit the sun and not the earth. Um, they are basically dirty snowballs. Um, so when you see them with a, um, with a telescope, um, it's kind of fuzzy and it has a bit of a tail. Um, it is very likely that it was being hit by the comet that brought water to the earth. 
lot. In um, 1705, um, Edmund Halley predicted that this comet that had been traveling, that had been documented for several hundred years, was going to come back in 1758. Um, he used the uh, laws of motion that Newton had d devised. And um, lo and behold, 76 years later, um, the comet did arrive. Now, we look at this graphic here. These are the orbits of the planets, which are fairly much parallel to one another, effectively in the same plane. I'm usually talking to people so I can tell people where a plane is. Um, three points to find a plane. Um, whereas the comet is definitely an ellipse, much more elliptical and is, and is um, tipped into the plane. So the planets are here, the planets are here, and they, yeah, a comet's gonna come up in that direction. And just to point out, our dear friend Pluto is not in the same plane as um, the rest of the planets. The other thing we wanna look in this side is that the tail of the comet is always pointing away from the sun. And that is due to the solar winds. So, um, Haley said it was um, the planet was going to come back, or the comet was going to come back, and uh, he ended up dying before 1758. So the people thought it was a good time to have a party and make some money. Um, so they started; they, they did celebrate the return of Haley's comet, and they were very excited when it actually did come. They named it after him, and um, some enterprising people went and made pills so that you would not die from the gas that the comet was going to give off, um, which didn't act, they, they must have worked because nobody died from it. The comets do not fly in the sky, meteors do. Comets actually stay in the sky for, depending upon the comet, anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. This particular comet back in uh, 13 um, was only visible in the, Northern Hemisphere for um, for a couple of weeks, um, and it's the comet Pan Stars, and it was only visible just after sunset and just before itself set. So on the um, you can see this over the course of a couple of weeks, um, it moved north in the sky, and um, it could be seen. Basically, it looks this one particularly looked more like a a, a jet stream. But you take a telescope and you can see a little more. Um, and uh, I think that was in 13, um, was the comet Gra um, Garad. Uh, and you, they were able to, or we are able to um, plan and know exactly where it's going to be on which day and where to look. And you're going to be able to see it. This one was done with it, with a telescope. And Hale Bob in 95. You have a really pretty two different tails there. Um, my sister, who is does not look at the sky that often, called me up and told me there was a star in the sky that didn't belong and what was it doing there? So they are visible with the naked eye. What are they made of? Dirty, snowy snowballs. Um, the center of the nucleus is um, solid. Um, it's about... Um, five miles wide. Um, the coma on the outside of it is a blob of gas. Um, as this, the um, comet gets closer to the sun, um, it's going to melt some more. And as it melts some more, you get more debris coming off of it. And as the debris come off of it, you get your tail. When you speak of the ion tail, think of a fluorescent light or a neon light. The gas particles are are, are lit, lit because of the heat and the speed and the friction that's going on. Um, the vapors that you know, have the solid um, frozen ice and, and, and chemicals, as it gets closer to the sun, they just sublimate. It, it's so hot and so fast that it, they, don't, they skip the liquid state. They go directly from solid to, um, to gas. Um, Scientists are interested in the um, 
make up of the comments because of um, they show us what the beginning of the solar system is. Um, so we talked about the comets. We have the long, the short period of comets that come from the Kuiper Belt, um, which is this area here. And then you have the long period comets that go out to the Oort cloud. Um, Johann Oort had theorized the existence of the Oort cloud back in 1950 and um, the Dutch American um, Kuiper um, theorized the Kuiper Belt. You look at this, um, graph. It's not linear. Um, it's called a logarithmic graph. So it's 1, 10, 100, 1,000. And also they're using an AU. And we'll talk to you what an AU is. But basically there are two types of comets, short period comets that probably generate out here where Pluto is. Um, and come into the solar system in less than 200 years, and then the longer comets that generate out in the Oort belt. Scientists like to make things very visual so they can see it in their mind. Um, so we can say that the Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun, and we can say that, um, yeah, I forgot how many miles Saturn is, but well, we created a uh, unit of measurement called one astronomical unit, one AU, which is 93 million miles. Um, one light year is 63,000 miles. So when you're talking about the, the solar system, we usually talk in terms of AU. And then once you get out of the solar system, we start talking in terms of light years and a light second being 186 thousand miles. Um, a light second is not a unit of time, it's a unit of distance. Um, the near-Earth comets are considered the short period comets. Um, any near-Earth comet that comes within 0 0.05 or 5 hundredths of an AU is considered um, a possible near-Earth comet, which needs to be watched at. And we'll take a moment to celebrate Pluto. Today, 92 years ago today, um, Clyde Tombaugh out in Arizona found Pluto. It was there all the time, it was not lost. And what it is called doesn't really matter. Um, it is um, definitely part of our solar system. And we will see that the names of objects do change over time. Um, the, it is um, smaller than the rest of the planets. It is not in the same plane as the rest of the planets. And its orbit is more elliptical than the rest of the planets. And there are a whole lot of other stuff out in the Kuiper Belt. Um, so the fact that they're calling it a dwarf planet does not make it any less important. And we must celebrate its anniversary. Okay, so we did comets, and now we'll talk about um, asteroids and meteors. Um, asteroids are rocky fragments, yeah, bits of rock um, that cannot be seen without a telescope. So in the 1700s, they figured out where Earth's now in a um, solar center or heliocentric society. You know, so they, all the planets are going around the sun. No one's complaining about the Earth being the center of the, of the solar system. Um, and they're looking at the planets that they know of, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which you can see without a telescope. Um, and they decided that there's way too much space between Mars and Jupiter. So there must be a planet there. So they took out their telescopes and started looking. Um, in addition to a planet there, they also thought there could be another planet further out. And Herschel found Uranus in um, 1781. And uh, Mr. Piazzi found Cirrus in the area of between Mars and Jupiter in 1801. 
Um, so this is an actual photograph taken by the Dawn mission. Um, some of the pictures are really, really good, but they are actually not photographs, but just a really good artist's rendition. Um, after finding Cirrus, they found Vista. <laughs> nice size, um, fairly large. And um, the asteroids they were finding were not regular shapes. They were, um, some of them were round, but very few of them. Um, some of them, a lot of them look like dog bones. Uh, and it has to do as they're studying them with how they were formed as you need enough mass in order to create that spherical shape. Um, they have also found that there are um, about 150 asteroids that have moons um, and they're called binaries. And we have Didymus and Dimorphos are one pair, um, which we will talk about later. Um, Didymus, it's fairly, that is a picture, um, whereas Dimorphos is an artist's rendition from the information that we have. Asteroids are um, defined by the type of material that they are made out of, um, whether it's a uh, rock and clay, um, some um, iron and nickel in with the silicate material, silicate being sand, um, or whether there's more nickel and iron than it is within, in volcanic um, gases. So they're divided up into their type, their, what they're made out of, and their location. And so you have the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Um, depending upon your screen, we have Jupiter actually has Trojans and Greeks following them. So you have some asteroids along the same path as Jupiter up here and then some more up there. 90% um, of the asteroids um, are in the belt. And where are the other 10%? We found over a million of them. Um, they range from sizes from um, several hundred kilometers, so a kilometer is a little over a half mile, um, to uh, less than a half mile. The total mass of all of the asteroids is 4% um, of our moon mass. So there's not a lot, there's a lot of them, but they're, they're, not, they're not very massive. Um, the four largest, asteroids actually take up um, almost half of the entire mass of all the asteroids around. And Cirrus itself takes up about 30% of the entire mass, which is why Cirrus is now called a dwarf planet. It went from planet to asteroid to dwarf planet to keep Pluto um, company. 90% is in the area. This is a better picture of the Trojans and the Greek and the German. Um, occasionally, asteroids get pulled off their path um, by gravitational pulls of planets or, or um, comets coming by and moving them out of their way. Um, there's also people believe that the moons of Mars had been um, asteroids and then the gravitational pull um, brought them into the orbit of Mars. The other 90% are near Earth or close to Earth. The blue line here is the orbit of the Earth. As the Earth um, goes around, we have a bunch of um, asteroids in these uh, locations that are intersecting and passing through our orbits. At one time, they were very concerned about Orpheus because it was coming very close. They knew that it was coming close. Um, it's more than a thousand feet. We figure the um, John Hancock building is under 800 feet. Um, but having been studied, they know it will not hurt the Earth. Uh, however, it will come between the, the Earth and the Moon, and the Moon is only 250,000 miles away.
asteroid belt, we have that covered. As the meteor, I, I'm sorry, as the comet goes through the Earth's orbit, we know that it gives off debris because it's melting and all that dust is coming off. And it leaves that dust in that spot in space. And so the Earth goes through that spot in space every year. And so this coming April, um, you may be able to see a meteor shower, which is where these meteor showers come from, comets debris, um, uh, which was uh, formed by the um, comet Thatcher. Um, but Thatcher is a 400 year, 450 year comet. So um, it's not gonna be around for a while, but you will be able to look at the, um, the, com the, the liar, it, it, uh, is the constellation. Um, it's by the Southern Cross. If we have time, we can look at it on, a, on this star match at the end. Um, so that's where we get meteor showers. Comet, dirty ice snowball, asteroid, large rock, bigger than a meter, could be several hundred kilometers wide. Meteoroid is less than a meter. And um, a micrometeoroid is uh, less than a quarter inch. When these particles, objects, whatever you want to call it, come near the Earth, the arc gravitational pull of the Earth pulls them in. They get pulled in. The friction between the particle and the um, atmosphere heats up the particle and starts to burn it. If it's a little green, you see a nice little flash of light going by. Um, if it's bigger, you can get as much as a fireball. And if it's really big, um, you'll get a bowl eye. Um, if they're big enough, they'll just be a rock that lands on the ground. Um, if they're really big, they'll either explode above the ground or hit and make a great big crater. Um, how many do we get? We get basketballs every day two or three basketballs every day. They don't always get down to the, um, to the earth, um, but they do fly in. And if you're lucky, you can see a meteor um, on any given night. Um, every month or two, we'll get a meteor the size of a car. And we're still looking for the other 10%. And we know where some of them have been. The um, Tuskegee, you know, no, Tuskaga. Um, event in 1908 took place in um, Siberia. Um, there were several hundred people in the area and they did get some verbal accounts from eyewitness um, 10 years later because it took that long, well, eight years to, for people to get up there. Um, however, um, the explosion was heard by many people not in the area and that the barometric gauges, the pressure gauges were were registering all around the world, so they knew that it happened. Um, now, in um, we'll go to forty-seven first, nineteen forty-seven, um, in the uh, mountains over here, Chicote, uh, Chicoline, um, in Siberia, they. Um, had a very large iron meteorite. Um, they've had iron meteorites in the past. Nothing was ever this large before. It was estimated to be um, 70 kilotons. And there's a whole lot of um, asteroids that remained in the area that was scattered around. And February 15th, over in the Ural Mountains, um, there was an asteroid that came into the Earth, um, and there was a whole lot of webcams. And for some reason, the Russians were driving around with their webcam on at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, the asteroid came in at a very shallow angle. Well, where are we? Shallow angle. Um, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 20 degrees. So it's a fairly shallow angle. Um, 
most of the astronomers were looking at a uh, asteroid that was coming between the Earth and the moon. So they weren't watching the other side of the sky. So they missed this altogether. Um, as it came in, it was coming in at like 12 miles per second. And it ended up exploding about uh, 10 miles um, above the Earth. Um, and as it exploded, again, you have that massive pressure change when it explodes. Um, there was a period of time when it was actually brighter than the sun. One thing to learn, if you see a um, meteor, open your windows because the majority of the accidents and in, in injuries was because of flying glass. Um, but um, hopefully we won't have to use that bit of information. There are asteroids all over the, or craters all over the world. This particular one was found a couple of years ago um, using a GOI. It was uh, mapping the, uh, the Earth, and they found this little notch in the middle of the Egyptian desert. And they went out and they were actually able to find that it, it was a meteor crater that they did not know about because nobody goes out there. It's a lot easier to find meteor craters and meteorites. Um, in the desert and in Antarctica and than it is to find it in New Hampshire. So we'll never know if that boom we had last summer was either, was actually a, a meteor um, or something else. Um, but in this particular crater, they were able to find a lot of those iron um, meteorites. I lived in New York for a while, so I have to talk about the um, meteor that hit the car in 1992. In addition to the uh, meteor in, in 2013 that they were watching and predicted that it was going to go between the Earth and the Moon, um, the first time they were able to predict an asteroid was in 2008. And they found the asteroid and did their calculations. And um, it hit pretty much where they said it was going to hit. And the event that we all learned 66 million years ago, a mountain-sized asteroid slammed into the Earth off the coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, dooming the, the dinosaurs and leading to their distinction, uh, extinction. Um, the collision was cataclysmic, um, triggering tsunamis um, along the uh, coastline and firestorms. Um, the impact also affected the dust and vaporized the rocks. Um, those rocks had sulfur in it. The sulfur became sulfur, sulfuric acid, and it was not a very nice place to be um, shortly after that. Um, this is a report from um, 1988 through May of last year, which came from a dark presentation of all of the meteor pits that we are aware of, um, that one being the one in the Ural Mountains in 2013. So there's a plan. There actually is a planet defense system. A planet defense system is an organization um, by NASA. Um, it is in coordination with international um, space agencies and governments. Um, we have to look for them, we have to study them on Earth and in the, um, with satellites, and then we have to mitigate. Um, FEMA is actually doing exercises. They pretend they're having a, um, an asteroid is going to hit, and they do these exercises to figure out what one would do in case of an asteroid hit and how to deal with it so that we don't become a uh, Bruce Willis movie. So we'll talk about characterization and wise first um, and how they go about doing things. Um, the Torino scale is what helps um, rank the uh, asteroids so that we're not studying all of them all of the time. Um, so they have them by size and location. Um, they need to be uh, 1.3, astronomical units from the sun, that means between 
um, just a little between us and Mars and to the sun. Um, comets have to be a, a two year, a 200 year short period comet and also come within uh, five, um, five hundredths of an AU to, towards the earth. The potential, well, the potentially hazardous comets and objects have to be bigger than 460 feet and five hundredths of an AU. I read that wrong. And five hundredths of an AU is 4,647,790 miles. So five hundredths of an AU, 0 0.05 AUs is just an easier number to understand, to get a hold of. Um, more than a million asteroids have been discovered. Um, they believe that they know 95% of the larger ones, anything greater than a kilometer. Um, once an asteroid is discovered, um, we calculate where it's going to be in the future uh, using the different rules. Um, the discovery of an asteroid and deciding the size of the asteroid is a different issue. We're looking at these two asteroids, which are um, with visible light, um, of the colors that we see. Um, and with visible light, you have these two asteroids and they look pretty much the same. Um, Weiss Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, otherwise known as WISE, which had a second life as NEOWISE, um, can look at these two dots and we can see that they are actually very different. Um, one is extremely reflective in uh, visible light, um, whereas the other one is not reflective in visible light. And to our, this is what they actually look like. Um, so we can figure out which ones are big and which ones are small. Uh, the nice part about this using the infrared is that it doesn't show us more stuff. It actually shows us less stuff because we can differentiate. On the right, you see a model where you have um, the visible light and, and you're looking at it. And then with the new modeling, you can get rid of 16,000 possible objects that are actually gonna be close to Earth. And then another example of why using different wavelengths of light to look at things is, um, is very useful. Um, using visible light, you have a really big something and you have a really small something. And when you look at the same three objects in infrared light, um, they're pretty much all the same size. And that's due to um, the, their makeup and their reflective um, abilities. Oh, before we leave that, um, we not only use infrared light, but we also use uh, x-rays, radio waves, and so you use the various different uh, electromagnetic waves as telescopes effectively um, to get different information from the objects. That we're looking at. We go to um, DART, Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Um, they, do, they wanted to find a way to practice moving an object um, without causing more damage. So they decided, well, it will take a little solar system all into itself. So they, they chose um, this binary, which I showed earlier, um, Didymus and Dimorphos, and they've been able to study it because it comes fairly close to Earth. Um, so they can see it visually for a good portion of, of its um, orbit. And Didymus is um, 160 meters. It has an orbit of 11 hours, so it goes around every 11 hours. Um, and then we have the uh, DART, which was actually launched on um, Thanksgiving Day. And we'll do a little video here. This technique um, is used to find um,
exoplanets originally also. Um, so you don't actually see what you're looking at. You look at the light, you look and you measure the amount of light coming off of the main object that you're looking at. And then as the light changes, you measure the amount of the change of the light. And in doing that, you can then calculate the size of the object that's going around, the length of time it takes for it to go around, and then get all sorts of really cool information out of that object. Um, and they were able to do that, so they have all the data they need ahead of time. This is another graphic from DART. Um, um, the um, Earth and Dart and Didymus are going around one another and Thanksgiving of last year, they launched Dart. And come uh, October of this year, uh, the Earth, Didymus and Dart are all gonna come together. And we're going to be able to watch it from Earth And we'll do them one more graphic. And this is, these are graphics. These are not live pictures. Didymus goes around. Um, and as this goes around, we um, have a dart coming in. And that's fun. What happens is there's a little door. There we go. There's a little door on um, on Dart that just opens up, and they drop this camera out, and then the camera opens up its uh, solar panel to give it power as Dart crashes into the Morphus. So that three minutes later. The camera comes and takes pictures. We're not really concerned about how much um, uh, how big the crater is. They don't think they're going to be able to get a crater picture out of that, but they will be able to get a picture of what Didymus looks like. Uh, I'm sorry, Dimorphus looks like um, three minutes after impact. So why, why would it be different? Um, if you have a cue ball, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be solid. And if you give it a nice little tap with, um, with another ball, it's just gonna move a little bit. You know? There's just one tap, action and reaction. It's gonna, the amount of energy that gets put in is gonna be the amount of energy that gets put out unless there's friction and you're in space and so you don't have a lot of friction. However, if it's a um, amorphous, um, yeah, we missed a picture there. You get the idea. Um, you hit it here, it's not particularly dense, but it's not particularly granular and it will grow up and then it will have this little jet reaction that will push it forward. And, and then if it's more or let more porous, um, you're gonna get a larger jet reaction and it's going to get pulled in, um, which is why, uh, yeah. They wanna measure this new orbit afterwards. Um, and that's that's the important thing. They'll be able to figure out how far the um, dimorphous had been moved and where the or where the orbit put it or where it got where the new orbit would be. Um, the, the camera um, is um, a camera that they borrowed from the, um, from the Italian space agency. Um, and it's a nice little um, 
device, it's a thumb little device, it opens up and when it's stowed, it's just a little rectangle. And then when it gets literally dropped into space, it opens up its solar panels and then um, gets energized and is able to move that. So um, you have the, NASA is doing the intercept with DART and is actually going to hit the planet or the asteroid in, um, and this coming fall. Um, and then the European Space Agency is following up um, with, with their satellite and they will be going to the same uh, binary in order to um, get better pictures, um, up close pictures so that you don't have to rely entirely on um, land-based observation. This is not a, um, we, we say NASA, but in actuality, um, this is based on um, a uh, John Hopkins idea. Um, and all of these institutions are working on the DART project in addition to the European Space Agency is, is collaborating as well. So let's the talk. We have a, we have a couple minutes. Um, I'm a hardware person as opposed to it. So I always like looking at the different toys that are on the spacecraft. Um, so there are various different technologies that are being used. If you're interested in the meteor shower, that's going to be the end of April of this year, Vega is the star, the lyre is the constellation, and the meteor shower are called the um, variants. And it will be a more or less in that area. It's gonna be pretty close to the horizon. Um, and this is uh, like 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and there's a, also a moon coming. So this may not be the best time to look for them. But anytime you want to see a meteor shower, um, they're all labeled online as to when the showers are uh, available. And depending upon your location, um, some of them are better than others. And there are actually other showers that you could be seeing um, uh, in late April, but they're of various, they're not part of the comet showers. So there's the, there's the polar star pointer, little dipper pointer star, that's the north. And then this would be, and be part of the um, summer triangle, but it's, a, it's not all up yet. And then the, the other thing which I, I skipped. So this is not an actual asteroid, it's just a make-believe asteroid. It's um, 50 meters. Yeah, so you figure it's a little bigger than a, than a football field. And if we pretended that a potato is your average asteroid, where would your next asteroid be in your, um, if you're in the asteroid belt? You know, maybe we'll just stop here and people can uh, put in guesses. Where do you think the next potato would be if you're in Tewksbury, Massachusetts? Um, Doug, Robert? Well, I'll call it Doug. I'm sorry, Regina. It took me a second to unmute. Right. Uh, yeah, let's hope the potato doesn't hit, uh, hit us in Tewksbury, that's for sure. Um, so Regina, are we okay now to go to uh, Q and A or? Yeah, we are okay to go to Q and A. And if anybody wants to um, talk about where they think the potato would be in the asteroid belt, if they're in Twixbury, Massachusetts, they can put in a, um, a a city or a town in the Q and A. Okay. Uh, so uh, an anonymous attendee asks, "What about uh, a couple of questions here?" Uh, what about Starlink satellites, uh, 40 Starlink satellites doomed by geomagnetic storm a few weeks ago, uh, the, around the beginning of February? 
And then I don't know if you mentioned this one, uh, but uh, I guess uh, I, I heard about this on the news a couple couple nights ago that there's a um, uh, I don't know a Chinese rocket that's going to hit the moon in a couple of weeks. Have you heard about that? Um, yeah, well, they're not going to hit the moon. They, yeah, they are going to the moon to um, believe they're going to try to collect some more data. Didn't actually read up on it, but yes, I did know about um, the Chinese having a um, satellite going to the moon. Um, and no, I did not know anything about Starling. I did not read up on that. Yep, no worries. All right, so uh, Francis says, thank you, Regina. Renee says, uh, welcome, yay. Gail says, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other questions or comments for Regina before we uh, head out uh, a couple minutes early here? Uh, Renee says, meteor showers are predictable and consistent. Why does the solar wind not blow the debris uh, field dust? Um. I'm sorry, why, they, why, it, why yeah, it I didn't word that correctly. So she says meteor showers are predictable and consistent. So why does the solar wind not blow the debris field dust? Um, the solar, well, they're going to, yeah, the solar winds kind of, yeah, that's a good, yeah, yeah they don't. The solar winds um, will blow the tail, but the dust is still gonna sit there in the particular area, they're not going to get because they're really small. So yeah, Mark, it doesn't. I don't know why it doesn't. That's okay. Uh, Mark says thank you. Jody says great talk. Enjoyed the new information. Thank you. Uh, Catherine says uh, thank you so much. And uh, yes, Catherine, I'll send you the recording. Teresa says thank you. Uh, Olga says, can this talk be available as a recording, please? And yes, it will be. Uh, you'll be receiving it uh, from me this afternoon via email. Uh, let's see, Mike asks, can you say more about the asteroid that was a planet, then an asteroid, and now a dwarf planet? Oh, okay. um, sure, we can, uh, we can go back to that slide. Cirrus. Um... Back there. Oh, here, well, I'll, um, I'll escape out. I'll escape out. Oh, that gave it. And we can go back to Cirrus. Um, so um, they needed telescopes to look for asteroids, and they thought that there would be something between Earth. Uh, between Mars and Jupiter, but they didn't know what that something is. Um, Cirrus being the largest of the asteroids, remember it took uh, one third of, uh, of all the asteroids combined, that's how, how massive it is, um, was found first. It was found first because you could see it better. Uh, this again is an actual picture and not a, a graph. When I found it, they said, we're looking for planets. We're calling it a planet. It's the first one and the only one we have. So now we have an extra planet. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Cirrus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, and actually by that time, they also had Uranus. It was five years later or 45 years later when they ended up with um, 40 more planets that they decided that planet is really not a good name for all these objects that they're finding in this space. And so they named it um, asteroid. After Pluto was um, studied and they realized that it, its orbit is different, its mass is different, um, they defined dwarf planet as a round object of a certain size with a certain orbit um, well, planet is the wrong word, object is probably a better word. And so they defined dwarf planet and Cirrus fits into the definition of Pluto's dwarf planet definition that was created for Pluto. So um, again, scientists like to put like things together. It's easier to study them that way. And um, that's why they changed the name. It's just a classification. It's like 
libraries are doing away with the Dewey Decimal System and going to the new system. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, Regina, because we're actually in the process of uh, going from Dewey to uh, the new system called BISAC uh, yeah. here in Tewksbury, which is like, originally I thought that was sacrilegious to abandon Dewey, but uh, I think uh, I think we're uh, doing the right thing here. I think people and, will like, and people, yeah, people will like the finished product. I'm, I'm, uh, is, has your library gone to uh, BISAC or something else? Uh, no. Not yet, yeah. No, not yet. Gotcha. All right. Well, Kristen says, thank you. Renee says, awesome talk. Phil says, if the comet is a potato, I would guess the next one will be in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> there you go. A little humor. Uh, Bernard says, very informative. Uh, Molly asks, is the purpose of the dart just to see what the asteroid is made of, or is its purpose to knock it off its orbit? Knock it off its orbit. A redirect, um, DART is a redirect mission. So they want, the idea is they want to know whether, how they were, if there was an asteroid coming to Earth, how would they hit it so that it would go someplace else um, and have it controlled? Because you don't want to just hit it and, and have it go someplace else and hit something else. Um, so the object is to hit it and to see where it goes. Um, Osiris Rex is a um, program from NASA that has already gone out to the asteroid venue and touched down on the asteroid venue a couple of times, picked up four pounds of venue's surface um, and is bringing it back to, uh, to Earth in a little Amazon box, I guess. Um, I guess the NASA box. And it's going to, in a couple of years, it was, it's gonna drop it on earth and then they'll have the box of Bennu to study. But no, we're not looking at the surface. We're actually looking at where the um, smaller asteroid is gonna go in relationship to the bigger asteroid. So Mike asks, is it really worth spending money to protect ourselves against asteroid collisions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's uh, you know, if, if, as I was asked once before, um, many, many years ago, and if for a moment I thought the money spent was gonna go to world peace and feeding the hungry, I'd say, you know, do it, but that's not gonna happen. Um, and I think it's important, knowledge is always important. Um, useless knowledge um, one day becomes very vital the next. Uh, when I was in the semiconductor industry, we were doing research and development, and a lot of the stuff we were doing was just science, which we were pretty lucky because most industries nowadays can't do that. Um, and the science we were doing was pretty useless at the time. And 10 years later, it became the foundation for the telephones we have today. Um, so studying the asteroids now, trying to figure out a defense system. You know, it may seem a little Star Wars, um, but um, we, you know, having the knowledge is not going to be a bad thing if, um, if we're gonna need it someday um, and somebody's gonna find a way of using it. So yeah, um, it's a good argument that um, I think it's important to study things for the sake of studying them. It's, it's a, got to remember that Newton was rich and studying was a leisure. It was not, it, you didn't go to school be, to learn things. Um, only the rich went to school, not because they were rich and could afford it, but they had the time. They did not have to farm the field and, and cook the dinners. Um, they had the time and the leisure to study. And I think even in today's day and age, we need to um, take the time and, and study things that may not be you know pertinent at the moment but could be very useful in the future and um let's see here you referenced um bruce willis and the armageddon film i'm <laughs> curious if you've seen the recent netflix film uh entitled don't look up have, have you have did you happen to see that one no i have not <laughs> very polarizing people either love it or hate it but uh uh, I think uh, you might uh, want to take a peek at that one. Uh, Mary asks, how fast do the asteroids move? 
And how much warning are we likely to have before one is headed for Earth? Um, warning, we hope to get 10 to 15 years um, and we need five. So that was, that's, that's, a, that's a number that I remember. And how fast are they moving? It is in one of my slides. Um, and I don't remember. Uh, yep. Yeah. Margaret asks, uh, Margaret <laughs> comments, ask the dinosaurs if it's worth spending the money uh, <laughs> on, on uh, preventing asteroid collisions here. Um, two more quick questions. Uh, if we monitor objects, uh, how does some sneak up on us shortly before it comes so close? I mean, you just referenced 10 to 15 years, but I, I feel like sometimes we find out about things a lot uh, lot uh, sooner than that. Well, yes, we do find things a lot sooner. Or than later that. than that, I should say. I'm sorry. You, you know um, what I mean. Well, with, um, as of now, we, we're looking at so many things, and we just got another telescope on, which came in the news last night, so I didn't get it in the fall. Um, but there's a new telescope that actually, we were doing the Northern Hemisphere with two telescopes in the Northern Hemisphere, but Chile and South Africa just came up with their telescopes so we can get the entire sky every day, which is something that did not happen prior to this week. Um, so with that in mind, we hope to find things, you know, 10, 15 years out. Um, there's one asteroid that's, you know, uh, 2182 that they're looking at, you know, that's the year that if it, if it were going to hit, it would be in 2182, but they don't think it's gonna hit, but it's the closest thing. And so they're looking at that. So we're talking a few years out. Um, the, 10 to 15 years is that like, that's what they need to know in order to do something about it. Does that answer the question? I... Sure. And um, let's see. Uh, we'll ask so James' question, we'll wrap us up as we've uh, reached 12 o'clock. Uh, how many man made objects can we see with the naked eye? And is there anyone that is particularly noticeable? Um, the International Space Station is very noticeable. Um, it reflects the sunlight, so you're going to see it at um, sunset and um, sunrise, um, and a couple hours after on either side. That, too, you can look up on the web, um, and it will tell you exactly where and when to look at it, because it's not visible all the time. And I have not seen any of the others, so I don't know if they're visible. I haven't gone looking for them. Right. And by the way, the other potatoes would be in um, Washington, D.C., Rochester, New York, or the Maine Canadian border. So although there's a lot of asteroids out in the asteroid belt, they're not very close to one another on a regular basis. There you go, Regina. I, I didn't even I want to offer a guess. I knew I'd be way off. Uh, Shane says, nice program. Thank you. So why don't we wrap it there? Do you have any last words for the group uh, before we wrap up? Um, the words of the Florida astronomer, keep looking up. All right, there we go. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Regina. Uh, look for an email from me later today with a feedback survey, a recording, and information about next month's uh, NASA Solar System Ambassador Program. Uh, thank you all and have a great day. Thanks, thank Regina. Nice me. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.